Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maria Bucur, and I am glad to present to you my progress so far regarding my PhD topic, which is diabetes mellitus across pancreatic diseases. I'm a third year resident uh, doctor in diabetology in Bucharest, Romania, and also a PhD student in Bucharest at Carol Davila University, and starting from this year as well here at CTM. And being a diabetologist, my vision is to decrease the burden of diabetes mellitus, and uh, my mission uh, at the moment is to improve prognosis of pancreatic disease patients by achieving well-controlled diabetes. To achieve my mission, uh, I have uh, two ongo ongoing projects. The first one is investigating therapeutic options for preventing or delaying diabetes mellitus in prediabetic patients. And we want to investigate this by performing a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And the second project is investigating the time dependency of beta cell function failure during acute pancreatitis, uh, this time by performing a registry analysis. And now I, I would like to introduce you to my first topic. And uh, I would like to start by presenting to you what is prediabetes. So prediabetes is the term used to describe individuals whose glucose levels are above the normal range but that do not meet yet the criteria for diabetes mellitus. At the moment, prediabetes uh, is not uh, viewed as a clinical entity but rather as a risk for progression to diabetes and also to cardiovascular disease. As you can see, uh, by 2030, uh, over 470 million people we have prediabetes. And furthermore, 5 to 10 percent of uh, this uh, population will progress to diabetes mellitus yearly. So what do we know about uh, diabetes mellitus prevention in this population? Currently, the American Diabetes Association recommends that we implement lifestyle modification, modifications with a goal of weight loss that uh, can reduce the risk uh, up to 70%. But lifestyle modifications are hard to follow long term. So it would be uh, beneficial that we would have a medication for this as well. Currently, there is no approved medication uh, for prediabetes, but metformin, which is an antidiabetic, can be used off-label. So our aim is to identify the most efficient intervention for preventing diabetes mellitus progression in patients with prediabetes. Naturally, our clinical question is what is the most effective intervention that can prevent or delay diabetes uh, in prediabetes patients? And we want to look at the population of adults with prediabetes and investigate uh, several interventions that aim to decrease the diabetes mellitus incidence. And our hypothesis is that lifestyle modifications are followed by a greater risk reduction than pharmacotherapy. Uh, what would be the clinical uh, implication? We will be able to uh, provide an answer for these uh, patients. Uh, what can uh, they do to prevent uh, the development of a chronic disease uh, that is, has also a great impact on the cost of health care? And of course, this is uh, another uh, implication for the policy makers that uh, it will be cheaper to prevent than to treat. Uh, for the systematic search, we used the following search key that consists of four domains. As you can see, we are interested in randomized controlled trials. The first domain refers to our population, and the second and the third domain uh, refer to our outcomes. After we did the systematic search, uh, we ended up with over 20,000 articles, and after the duplicate removal and the title and abstract selection, we have uh, 894 articles, and currently we will start the full text selection. Uh, moving forward, my second uh, topic is investigating the time dependency of beta cell function failure during acute pancreatitis. And I would like to start by inviting you to imagine a very simple clinical case. Let's imagine we have a, a patient, a female patient, fi uh, 53 years of age, that uh, presents with abdominal pain. Uh, we know that her uh, uh, amylase and lipase are three times above the normal range. We perform uh, an abdominal ultrasound and we can establish the diagnosis of biliary acute pancreatitis. But among the blood work, we can also see a blood glucose level above uh, 30 millimoles per liter, and we know that our patient did not have diabetes prior to this admission. 
uh, and we will see that uh, blood abnormal blood glucose levels are related to are directly related to severity of the acute pancreatitis and with mortality. So managing those, this blood glucose is a very important step in the uh, management of the patient. But if we look at the currently available guidelines about uh, acute pancreatitis, we don't see any information regarding insulin treatment. So the clinical case that we imagine would not be singular because as you can see, stress hyperglycemia is common in early stages of uh, AP. Uh, and it's a sensitive indicator of the severity. Abnormal blood glucose levels are uh, independently and those dependently associated with AP severity and mortality, as I said, and even though organ failure is seen in 20% uh, uh, of cases with AP and uh, several major organs have been widely investigated, there is scarce data on the beta cell function during uh, the course of the disease. So our aim is to describe the beta cell function during AP. And our clinical question is what is the time dependency of beta cell failure during the course of AP? We would like to investigate adults with AP that are exposed to different levels of glycemia during the course of the disease. And the outcome is the insulin administration, the need for it, the dosage, the day of the administration, and the route of administration as well, and we hypothesize that there is a time dependency in insulin necessity during AP, meaning that in the early stages there is a high insulin necessity, and in the late phase there is a low insulin necessity. The clinical implication will be that we will understand better the dynamics of the beta cell uh, function during the course of the disease, and we can also provide new information to the AP guideline. Uh, we want to use the AP registry that was launched in 2012 by the Hungarian Pancreatic uh, Study Group that collects prospective and international data uh, um, regarding uh, acute pancreatitis patients from the admission to discharge and we can see we have information also about the insulin treatment that it's in our interest. So we want to collect data, of course, about the diabetes mellitus status, the etiology, the recurrence of the AP, uh, some uh, anthropometric measurements, some uh, blood work as well. So in summary, I have two ongoing projects that I hope to finish by uh, the summer of 2024. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and to leave you with uh, a quote from an Irish politician that says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is most probably there are, you know, meta-analysis on this in this matter, I mean, on my first your topic. First, first project, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there is a Could recent meta-analysis published in 2022, actually. Uh, so, so pretty quite recent. young? Yeah, but they did not investigate uh, every intervention, so there is no information about the currently new available medications like the uh, GLP-1 uh, receptor antagonists that uh, are very popular these days. They uh, are very good for weight loss and uh, we can use them possibly for prediabetes as well. Uh, and I'm interested also, I found articles about several other types of interventions like uh, uh, using technology and um, sending messages uh, about reminding patients to do their steps each day to eat a healthy diet that apparently work as well. So I'm interested in all types of interventions in, in the 2002. 22 meta-analysis, they were looking only at lifestyle, metformin, pioglitazone, and uh, that's it. Congratulations. Uh, I was wondering, are there other acute diseases for which there are recommendations of insulin treatment for patients without diabetes but with high glucose levels? Uh, yes. So uh, in the ICU, uh, we have... Uh, there is the intensive insulin treatment, which uh, targets um, a blood glucose level between 80 and 110 milligrams per deciliter, and the conventional insulin therapy, which targets a blood glucose level uh, much more relaxed, uh, between 140 milligrams per deciliter and 200 milligrams per deciliter. 
Actually, there is a meta-analysis looking at these uh, two insulin therapies in the uh, AP patients uh, that says that uh, intensive insulin uh, therapy is better, but uh, the meta-analysis only consists of three studies and it was uh, uh, not so many patients included. And we have also a contradictory data that says that intensive insulin therapy can worsen uh, the outcome because of the hypoglycemia uh, risk. So we would like to investigate this using the, the registry and maybe we can find a better answer. I have a question regarding your first topic. Um, you mentioned that uh, you want to include all of uh, the interventions in your analysis. And my question is, do you plan to include, for example, um, CPAP? in um, OSHA patients, or uh, do you want to include surgery for weight reduction as well? Uh, actually, I found articles about CPAP in uh, patients with prediabetes that also have sleep apnea, and yes, I would like to include them as well because they report data about uh, glycemia, and it, appear, it appears that it, it is improved in patients who, who are given CPAP therapy. Uh, but I haven't found many articles about uh, bariatric surgery, so I will include them, but yeah. Thank you very much. So if there are no, there is one more. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Very nice presentation. I wanted to ask if you're planning to include also patients who are using uh, a liraglutide or like here and also known as Saxanda, yeah, yeah. uh, because I think it's a very hot topic currently, and also in America using the Ozempic uh, variation. As I said, it's, uh, it falls in the GLP-1 agonist category, which I, I already said, yeah.